morning. Welcome to River of Life Online. My name is Brent Hudson. I'm the pastor of River of Life Church, and I'm glad that you've joined us here today. As we gather virtually today, uh, it's so important for us to prepare our hearts to worship and to receive from the Lord. It's easy for us to think in times like this that we are giving up so much because of the pandemic and all of the adjustments that need to be made. And that is true. However, as we come together at this time, we need to be confident that the Spirit of God will meet us where we are, regardless of our global health situation. So let's come to the Lord today and prepare our hearts. And I'm going to call upon Travis Duke. He's going to read uh, an ancient prayer from the liturgy of the Orthodox Armenian Church. And we will begin with Travis leading us in this spiritual exercise. O Sovereign and Almighty Lord, look down from heaven on your church, on all your people, and on all your flock. Save us all, your unworthy servants, the sheep of your fold. Give us peace, your help, and your love, and send us the gift of your Holy Spirit, so that with a pure heart, and a good conscience, we may salute one another with a holy kiss, without hypocrisy and with no hostile purpose, but guileless and pure in one spirit, in the bond of peace and love, one body and one spirit, in one faith, even as we have been called in one hope of our calling, so that we may all meet in the divine and boundless love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. There is so much that we can learn from the global church, and not just the global church in the sense of geography, but also in time. We can look to the great creeds and the great prayers of saints in the past and be encouraged in our lives today. Yet, as we gather here online, let us unite our hearts together in prayer presently as we seek the Lord to minister to us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for the technology that allows it to happen. We pray, God, that you would be with us here now as we open our hearts to receive from your word, to get excited about what you have for us in the coming days. God, we pray as well that as we meet after in our Zoom call that you would minister to us and you would help us, and that, Lord, you would teach us. Uh, We've just come through a Thanksgiving season where we've reflected on the importance of Thanksgiving. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us in our hearts and in our emotional selves to move along that path of Thanksgiving and praise, even in the midst of difficulty. We pray, God, for our province that you would Uh, bring us back to a more stable place. We thank you for the good news of lower uh, people being infected with this virus. Uh, But God, we do pray that you would bring health back to our region so that we could open things up again and we could meet face to face. God, we know that you are here and we pray, God, that you would touch our spirits, our souls, by your power and by your grace. We pray that you'd have mercy on us today and that you would forgive us our sins and that, Lord, as we come to you, that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew 22, 34-40 This morning we begin a new series called Hanging On To Love, and in the tradition of the last number of years, it is an all-year-long series. From this point until the end of our ministry year, we'll be doing various themes 
as they connect back to this overarching idea of hanging on to love. The theme of this year's series is taken from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, but most importantly, verse 40. We're all aware of the greatest commandments, as Jesus declared them to be, to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and being, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we're very aware of the questions that that brought out in the listeners of Jesus' day, whereas in Luke's gospel, the lawyer responds back, who is my neighbor, to which Jesus gives us the Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, to show us that even our enemies are our neighbors. Uh, in other words, everyone is our neighbor. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel, we have that principle painted when Jesus says to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, who makes His Son to shine on the righteous and the unjust, uh, who causes the rain to fall um, on everybody. Uh, he is without, He shows no partiality in this way. And how we in the distribution of our love are not to show partiality between in-group and out-group as they did, or well, as all human history marks. Um, we are to be a people who are uh, loving others indiscriminately uh, in the way of Jesus Christ, who loved both the Roman centurion, the man of war, so to speak, and he loved the Samaritan with leprosy, and he loved the woman uh, Mary with seven demons, and he loved the righteous um, Simon who rejected him and made fun of him. Uh, we see in Jesus uh, an indiscriminate uh, love of neighbor because Jesus considered everyone his neighbor. Whoever God places in proximity to you has just become your neighbor. And so we see a redefining of concepts and a, and a, a classification of commandments in Jesus um, that not, isn't necessarily original with Jesus. We see even in Philo, the Hellenistic Jewish philosopher, a categorizing of the commandments into those which show love for God and those which show love for people. And this idea of love is central to the Jewish faith in itself. When Jesus quotes um, this great commandment from Deuteronomy 6.5, he's actually just tapping into the Shema, right? This, this classic Hebrew prayer declaration commandment that was recited uh, multiple times a day by the faithful Jewish people. Uh, Shema uh, Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Um, Love, the, here, Israel, uh, the, the Lord, Yahweh, is, um, is your God, and He is one. Uh, and then, of course, in the following verse, you will love Him. And on and on, you know, um, the whole self, the, the heart, every part of us is to be wrapped up in this love for God. And this was prayed multiple times a day. So it was no shock or surprise or even, uh, even it wasn't even contentious when Jesus said this was the greatest commandment. And even as he said the second greatest, which is similar to it, uh, wouldn't have drawn much argument. And in fact, um, we see in Luke's gospel that the lawyer who was present or the scribe uh, when in, in this story there uh, agrees with Jesus and says, well done teacher. Um, this is a good answer, right? So it's not like Jesus was being um, uh, catalytic in any way. Uh, he wasn't actually upsetting the apple cart by saying that to love God and love neighbor uh, is, is something that prioritizes all commands. The radical nature of Jesus' teaching came in his redefinition of who my neighbor is and then pulling together and tightening the, the link between showing love for God and neighbor. And so later in the New Testament, we have the Apostle John saying that you cannot say that you love God who you haven't seen and then not love this brother, this neighbor uh, who you can see. And that we are liars, basically, if we, if we say that. Because we show that we love God when we love those who are uh, around us, 
uh, whether they're like us or unlike us, whether they talk like us or smell like us or eat like us, whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that they, they, are, they are near us and therefore they are our neighbor and God has called upon us to show love and not just any love, but the love that Jesus has revealed to us in his own life. And so that's the series idea, these two great commandments. But it's this verse 40 that really captures our attention when Jesus says that uh, in these two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang on to. Uh, That's an amazing statement. And it often gets overlooked in reading this because we love to put attention on the love commandment. So here I am doing an introduction to this message and I've already spent a third of my time just talking about the love commandment because those are so important and we need to understand those. But the series, this particular series, is focusing in on verse 40, that everything in the law and the prophets are tethered to these two great commandments, these greatest commandments that Jesus gives us here in Matthew 22 and elsewhere. The, the thing that we see ultimately is that love is a organizational principle of all ethics. It stands at the top, you know, it is the thing that can never be violated. No matter how righteous we think we are by following all these other rules, if they violate this one at the top, then we have not done something righteous. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. That everything in the Law and the Prophets has to be weighed and held in the light of these great commandments of love. These, as he would say about other things in other places in the Gospels, these are weightier matters of the Law. Uh, And this would be the most weighty. This is the most important thing that we get right in this life, is to love God with all that we are, with everything we have and with everything that defines us, to love God and then to love neighbor uh, as ourselves. And we'll look more at our neighbor and who that is in weeks to come. You know, the, the first point I want to bring out in this message today when we look at this idea of love being the the thing that we tether to in our interpretation of the Bible and of life, is that relationship is the God way. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, theologian Gerald Bray has said in his uh, his recent uh, theology that unlike the Greeks and other philosophy, systems that generate a divine being or a a God, if you will. The revelation we get about God in the Bible is unique in that the first thing that is revealed about God is that God is a personal God. You can have a first mover or a primary cause and all of these other philosophical types of arguments to prove the existence of a divine force or divine being, but none of those will bring you to the God of the Bible, the God who becomes flesh and dwells among us in the person Jesus Christ. None of those will bring us to a personal God. The personal God is the God who reveals himself to us. When we first see um, this interrelationship between God and human beings in the book of Genesis, particularly the creation account in chapter 2, we have this uh, God who breathes life into the clay-formed human figure and they become a living soul, nefesh chaya. And it's an amazing thing, the intimacy that is related there, that God holds that face-to-face and breathes life into them. And we get a recap of that as Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit into his disciples as they meet in that room. All of this is to say an intimacy and a connectedness and a relationship is what God desires and has created us uh, to, to, to be in relationship with God. And and so if we've been created for relationship with God and one another, 
uh, because we know in the creation account that it's not good for man to be alone, right? It's not good for the man to be alone. So he creates another and then they create more and they become this created force in the world. And um, one can read those stories as giving a sense of this idea of relationship and connectedness as being part of God's plan. And so for us to be in relationship with one another and with God is at the heart of who God is and how God has revealed himself. God is a personal God and therefore relationship is the God way. You know, there is that um, uh, TV show uh, on Disney, right? The Mandalorian, which uh, where they, they all have this code and when they talk about their code, they always conclude that discussion with this is the way. And uh, in a way, I guess, uh, we Christians also have that code, not the Mandalorian code, but the code of Jesus Christ, where we are to love God and to love neighbor. And no matter what else happens, we have to stay true to those commandments because this is the way. It is the way of God to be in relationship with him and with each other. And the second point which guides us in this is that the path of relationships is love. You see, it's not enough for God to say we'd be in relationship to each other. We can be in relationship to each other and hate each other and be at war with each other and to be in a, uh, you know, a, a clan fight or a, a kin war or whatever those things were, the Hatfields and McCoys. Um, we can have a relationship that's rooted on violence, hatred and, and racism, um, all of those things. And it would still be, I suppose, a relationship but it's certainly not the kind of relationship that God envisions for us to have as he created us and held us up face to face and breathed life into us. There is a friendship and a, a connection that happens in the kinds of relationships that God desires from us and for us. And so we see from this passage in Matthew 22 that love of God and love of others is the path by which we are to build and journey in our relationships. We need to be anchoring ourselves or rather hanging on to love as we build relationships with others, with both God and neighbor. The third thing that I want to bring out, and this is more from uh, Dave Morehouse, who uh, last week, uh, the bishop who did the, um, the wedding for Harry and Meghan, uh, he published his book. And, uh, and of course, Dave went out and picked it up. We both were really impressed with that sermon. We loved it. Um, but he, he picked up that book and he just had so many quotes from it. Um, and the, the thing that really captured our attention is the, the Bishop Curry's belief that love would change the world. And I can't help but believe that in some ways, as we look at Roman history and we look at how Romans treated other people and we look at how they killed each other um, and they killed slaves, they held others with no regard whatsoever. Life was cheap and they really dispatched people from this life um, with ease. Um, they, there's no sense of human rights or uh, human care in the Roman Empire. Um, I mean, it was the Roman Empire that hung the Son of God on a cross, after all. And, uh, and many of those who believed in him uh, were fed to wild beasts in the most horrific of ways. And so we see that, that Rome uh, did not really reflect our modern ideas of human rights or the value of a human person. Those came later. And they came largely because of the Christian impact on society with this idea of love. It wasn't the Buddhist philosophy, which is the absence of suffering, but not necessarily any concern for justice. Um, it is this Judeo-Christian idea of love because uh, Jesus was being consistent with the, the teaching of the Hebrew Bible when he categorized these two commandments as the greatest. And then um, the Christians grabbed a hold of this and, and ran with it. Um, with this new interpretation of who our neighbor is. And literally, when you look at the spread of Christianity, um, you see the rise of human rights. You see the rise of people being treated 
differently. And we need to take note of that. The value of the human person is something which is central to a Christian worldview. And when the human person uh, is diminished, um, that is a sign of the lack of hearing Jesus clearly. And it, it is certainly not hanging on to love and tethering ourselves on this great revelation that Jesus gives us in Matthew 22. This idea of a revolutionary um, love, a love that, that could actually change the world. Uh, I mean, I believe uh, Bishop Curry when he says this, and because I see that it's already happened in the past, and it could continue to happen in the future. But it would require that you and I take seriously the words of Jesus, that we listen to what he said, that we understand that everything we do when we, try, when we attempt to live the life of righteousness and justice, when we read the Old Testament that talks about what does it mean to you know, follow God, this idea of having clean hands and pure hearts, this idea of, of justice and this idea of walking humbly with God, all of this is anchored in a central concept of love. And when we lose sight of that, when we lose sight of this centrality of the greatest commandments, we start to go astray. We start to go sideways. We start to hold other theologies that do not give honor to God in the way that God wants us to. And we've seen this. We continue to see this, even in the church today, where you have preachers who are angry and filled with a certain hatred for evil, but then they place that evil on humans, and then by you know they they vicariously begin to hate people, which is totally contrary to the way of Jesus, and totally contrary to this vision that Jesus had in Matthew twenty two forty, that we are to anchor everything interpretive in our lives upon this commandment to love God and to love each other. It's on these two commandments that all the law and the prophets hang on to. And that's what we want to do in this coming year, is we want to grab the force and the focus of these two ideas, and we want to use that as an interpretive lens as we go to the great heroes of the Old Testament, as we read other passages in the New Testament. We want to continue to come back and understand that for Jesus Christ, the love of God and the love of neighbor were the weightiest matters of the law. And everything else that God has revealed to us is hanging on to these, is tethered to these two ideas. And if we do not look for that tether, if we do not look for that line, we are no longer safe because our imaginations and our sin will cause us to interpret things in ways that go far wide of what God would want for us. There have been entire theological systems developed by racists to own other human beings and see them as less than fully human. This is evil. And yet these are Bible-quoting people. They knew their Bible. And when they went to church, they listened to Bible sermons, biblical sermons. But they weren't really biblical because they forgot the words of Jesus. And you and me, as we seek to live this life for God, we cannot forget the words of Jesus or the example of Jesus. If he is the fulfillment of all things in the Hebrew Bible, the fulfillment of God's revelation to us, we must listen to what he says and we must follow his advice, which is in this passage to understand that everything in the Bible comes back to loving God and loving neighbor. And so let's go on a journey together throughout the rest of this ministry year to read the old stories and the old passages that are favorites to us and to refocus them 
through these two great commandments that Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang on to. You and me. Let's go. All right, well, I think that sets us up well for the coming weeks, whether we're meeting virtually or whether we're meeting in person. Uh, I will still continue to put the teaching uh, pieces in our online channel here on, on YouTube and Facebook, and, uh, and you can catch us there if you're not able to get out in person to our services once they resume. And we'll make an announcement about what's going on with us in relation to our provincial health guidelines on our Facebook page. And uh, we will make that very clear to everybody so that you'll know what we're doing. Uh, well, that's about it for this week. And I do want to thank you for dropping in online. Uh, for those of you who are part of our local congregation, a link will be going out soon for you to join us in a Zoom call where we can pray for each other and encourage each other. But if you're not a part of our local congregation uh, or you're just not available for that call, I want to thank you for joining us today. And I pray that the Lord's blessing would be upon you. Let's pray together now as we dismiss. God, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us today to look to your word and to understand the bigger picture. That, Lord, it's not just about understanding all the little pieces and all the nuts and bolts of the Bible. It's about understanding them properly in light of Jesus Christ, in light of these greatest commandments that you've given us upon which everything else must hang from. And so, God, we pray as we move forward this year, but not just that, in our very lives and relationships and everything else, God, that you would help us to hang on to love and that you would teach us to be Christ-focused in not just how we live our lives, but in how we view your word and how we understand you. And we pray, God, that you would continue to reveal yourself to us through Jesus Christ in your word as we Hang on to this principle of interpreting, hanging on to love. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you back here in seven days. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you and give you peace.